What is going on, guys? My name is The Rose, and I'm joined again with Cypher for episode 5, part number 2. This is the all-Nintendo episode. We're going to go over a lot of Nintendo news that came out over the past few days. And it's all interesting, I think, for the most wait. part. Wait, 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 wait. If it's all Nintendo, that means I can't bitch about Final Fantasy XV. Well, you have a story you wanted to tell, so... I actually do. Yeah, that's true. It's true. You can start with yours first, though. So, uh, before we get into story time real quick, follow me on Facebook and Twitter, YouTube as well, Twitch, subscribe to the YouTube channel for more streams, more gameplay videos. I got Street Fighter V videos coming back to the channel in glorious 60 FPS. Also, follow Black Soccer on Facebook and follow Erin Fitzgerald, the wonderful voice actress, on all her social media. All the links are down below in the description box that you'll need. And with that said, so I went out food shopping today. We left the house around 11.30 this morning. Had to go to the library. I had to print out my, uh, my order receipt because I ordered a new jacket. And the fucking thing came in the mail... I don't even understand how a company could even sell a jacket like this. Like, there was clearly no quality control going on with this coat. As uh, when I received it, it had a tooth on the zipper track missing. The zipper wasn't even put on correctly, and there were two holes in the pocket lining in each uh, in one in each pocket. So I go to Walmart today after food shopping for fucking ever in a day. And I go to customer service and I go to return my jacket and I had to get it, the money put back on a Walmart gift card because I partially paid with a gift card. And they went to put my uh, refund on a gift card and it crashed their computer systems. So it took about five minutes, took almost a half an hour. And the longer I'm standing there at customer service, I'm just getting more agitated and agitated. Uh, mm -hmm. I am a quite the impatient kind of person, and depending on the situation, I'll have a short temper at some point, too. And then, uh, while I was standing online at the self-service uh, CSM desk, my mom went and she grabbed a couple things she had to grab. And we were going online to pay, and we were just about ready to pay, and she goes, Oh, I forgot hamburger rolls for tomorrow's dinner. So we had to get offline, had to go get hamburger rolls. Go grab the hamburger rolls. We're fighting the crowd in the store because Walmart's always a fucking madhouse. No matter what time of the day it is. We get back online. And we're next to pay again. My mom goes, oh, we need cat food. And at this point, I just fucking wanted to st uh, start tearing my hair out. And that's when I messaged you on Discord. I'm like, dude, kill me, please. I'm going to kill somebody today. I was literally at my breaking point. It took me about five and a half hours to go food shopping, take a five-minute trip to Walmart, come home and put food away. And the longer I was away from my computer and couldn't record this episode today, the longer I was getting, uh, the more I was getting aggravated. It, it was unreal. I never, I never seen computer systems crash at Walmart over doing a return before in my life. I see. It's ridiculous. Ugh. Yeah. I don't know. Walmarts here are usually pretty awful, too. Like, Okay, we went to the mall today as well. This isn't... My, my story was going to be about Final Fantasy XV, just because at this point I want it to be a once-per-episode thing where I bitch and moan about Final Fantasy XV. <laughs> but, um... We went to the mall, and I swear to God, people shouldn't be allowed to have children. Oh, yeah, I believe you there. Like, if your toddler can't walk among the crowd, pick them up. Yup. Like, Jesus Christ. Uh, second is, like, if you're in an aisle having a conversation, you should probably move to a more open area of the store so you're not blocking the fucking aisle. I agree. Like, have some have some fucking courtesy, right? Speaking um, so of, my, I'm sorry, no, speaking no, of ahead. people who crowd aisles having a conversation, how about the stupid motherfuckers who call, who have conversations on their cell phones with their phones on speakerphone so the entire store can hear their conversation? Yeah, 
Oh my god. Yeah, that's pretty bad, but I've only experienced that one once. Oh, the other day I went to put my nephew on the school bus, and there's a house across the street from uh, the bus stop. I guess this person got in their car, and they had their, uh, they're like one of those people that have their, their cell phone. They mm-hmm. have it like hooked into their uh, their radio or something. So that if they get a phone call, they can answer their phone, and the, uh, you know, the the phone, you know, volume comes through the car radio uh, speakers. Okay. Yeah. It was so loud. I heard it at my front door. Oh my god. I'm like, dude, shut your shit off, man. Nobody wants to hear your conversation. It's ridiculous. But yeah, I totally agree with you about the the, the whole mall, the mall situation. I can't yeah. tell you how many times. Toddlers just get in the way and they're fucking obnoxious. Well, it's like we went into a bookstore, which I'm not going to drop the bookstore's name just because, like, it's a Canadian thing. I'm pretty sure, like, you wouldn't have it. But so we go in and I go to the manga section and there's a guy in a wheelchair in the middle of the aisle. And I'm like, okay, well, this is a tiny aisle. Like, he can't help that he's dis- that he's got a disability. Like, I'm just going to come back later when he's done clogging up the aisle. That's different. Then you have, like, the like I said, the people who will stand in the middle of an aisle and just have conversations with each other are people who like, like I have I'm nearsighted, like I'm visually impaired, so I get down to actually like I have to physically get down and get up close to read the titles of books or games when I'm in a store. Oh, I'm the same fucking I'm way. So surprised, I've never gotten shit for that. <laughs> like, like I'm trying to see. It's like yeah, so am I. No, I just, I just, I just, I just fucking excuse. I just get the whole, oh, do you need me to read that for you, or are you okay? Fucking annoying. Like, if I I want your help, I'll ask for it. Exactly. Like, I went to a coffee shop once, and while I'm I'm standing in the coffee shop, and I whip out my cell phone to use the camera on it to read the menu, and the guy, like, the the, the barista looked at me like I was mentally ill. I was like, I'm not taking a photo of your menu, I'm just looking at your menu through my camera. Like, I'm blind, basically. But yeah, um... So the Final Fantasy XV story that I was going to tell uh, is kind of like... It's a little bit unrelated to anything else that's happened to me recently, but when we first got it... So, firstly, my roommate sprung for it. I didn't buy it, because I had no interest or any money. Oh, believe me, we know. (laughs) <laughs> I, I had zero interest in Final Fantasy 15, but my roommate was like, how much is it? It was on sale. So I ended up buying it under my PSN. So we start playing it or whatever, and I don't know if you've seen the character designs for the main four guys. Not really, he, no. Okay, well, he immediately... I'm, I'm going to send them to you over Discord if I can, but... <laughs> He immediately says, these guys are the JRPG Beatles. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, my <laughs> fuck. I've, I I found an image, and they're all in, like, their action fucking boy band poses and everything. Oh, dude. Okay, check your Discord. All right, let me, let me look at this. Whoops, that's Pokemon these are, game. These are the JRPG Beatles. Fr- from the left, you've got Ringo's... Prompto as Ringo Starr. <laughs> Gladiolus as George Harrison... Noctis as as Paul McCartney and Ignis as John Lennon. Yeah, and obviously the only character I recognize here is Noct- uh, Noctis. Because of Tekken? Yes. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> so, hey, to go back to the mall thing and, to- and toddlers real quick, or really any yeah. store in general this happens to, uh, how about when a freaking dumbass toddler is not paying attention where they're walking or they're being goofy and running around the store? And they just walk or run right into you. And then their parent gets mad because they think you knocked them over. It's like, no, your kid's just a dumbass. <laughs> Fucking like, oh my god. Sometimes I just hate people. <laughs> like, I, I have enough patience for people to be like, oh, I'm sorry. But right? immediately thereafter, I'm like, I'm just going to leave the store and come back when these toddlers aren't in here. Right. I mean, if, if you're going to give me shit, I'm not going to apologize. If No. If the kid falls over, you know, whether it's my fault or not... Okay, I'll say, oh, sorry, didn't see you or something. But if the parent's going to give me shit, I'm just going to look at you and be like, okay, fuck off. You know, no apology, just go fuck yourself. But uh, you you were supposed to work today. What happened with that? 
I uh, wasn't feeling well when I got up, so I ended up giving up the shift, but I feel fine now, which is good. <laughs> and you get to play video games instead of go to work. <laughs> which is awesome. Video games are always better than work. Yeah. So I have a thing about Capcom. I want to bitch at them real quick. So I went to GameStop yesterday when I went to the mall unexpectedly. And I bought mm. Street Fighter V, the arcade edition, for $10 and change. And it did come with the Season 1 and 2 characters, which I had already... I already had, like, 5 of the 12 characters already. Okay. And I was going through the game just to see, you know, the new game modes and stuff and every, see everything that was added. Mm-hmm. And I go into the story mode section... And there are, you know, there's the character stories, there's the general story, and then there's uh, difficulty settings and whatnot. Yeah. I noticed that the general story was grayed out and and uh, un unselectable. Now, the general story was added as a free uh, content patch in Street Fighter V in... July, I want to say. It was either J- July or August of 2016. It was okay. about six months after the game came out. Because some people were saying that the game lacked a, uh, a true story mode. Which it did. And what we got wasn't great, but it was better than nothing. So we were kind of happy with it. Uh, it took about three to four hours to complete. And I noticed that in this version of the game, you can't play it. Huh. I don't know if they took it out on purpose to like make it work with the arcade edition or if they're going to add to it so they disabled it for now or if they just completely fucked up. But I think it's really sad that you add the missing uh, arcade mode and the missing tag battle versus mode that people were bitching about over the past two years. We finally get that, but then you take away a game mode that was free... That we've had for a year and a half. That is now no longer playable. I don't you know, understand. I don't understand surprised. it. Like it's Capcom, they're kind of scummy. I just don't understand it. I don't know why they did that. For whatever reason, I don't know why they thought it was a good idea. Do you think that maybe it's because like you need to also have like vanilla Street Fighter Five to play that? Uh, I don't think so because the vanilla Street Fighter Five. Uh, if you didn't buy the arcade edition, the patch that came out converts the whole game to the arcade edition, mm-hmm. regardless. And uh, the patch, the uh, the arcade edition patch was like 13, 13.12 gigabytes or something, so it was pretty big. Pretty big patch. And they, they added like three game modes and they took one out. But they did not fix the fucking character select thing. It pissed me off back then and it pisses me off now. That you gotta hit the start button, you gotta go down to battle settings, uh, and then choose your favorite character. You gotta set your profile's favorite character as the character you wanna play as online. I fucking, I fucking hate it. I bitched about it in my review back then. In uh, late February 2016. They had a chance to fix it now and they didn't. I fucking hate it. Yeah. Street Fighter 4 wasn't like that. Why did they have to change it? They took something that wasn't broken and they broke it. This is why I don't play Street Fighter. (sighs) It it just aggravates me to no end. So. That being said, I guess it's time to get into some Nintendo news, huh? Alright. I didn't give you any of these links, did I? Oh, wait, um, didn't you talk to me yesterday about me talking about Monster Hunter World as well before we got into the news? You know what? You're right. Okay. Uh, well, I, on the same day that I got Dragon Ball Fighters, I ended up receiving a copy of Monster Hunter World. And I am, I have kind of a love-hate relationship with Monster Hunter up to this point. I had played all of the portable games except for 4 Ultimate. And I think Generations is also portable. So I played all the PSP ones, which is like 1, 2, and uh, I think it's Freedom Unite. And then uh, 3 Ultimate on the 3DS. I think that Monster Hunter World is honestly the only way to play Monster Hunter. Because although 
the portability has been taken away. It's just like it has really reaped the advantages of being on console. Like I don't know if you you're familiar with Monster Hunter. Very but, very little. I've never okay. played one before. Well, the way maps are designed in Monster Hunter is you have basically all of these interconnected zones that you have to load in because the the 3DS and the PSP aren't super powerful. Whereas on console, instead what happens is you have one giant map that has been in, that has been it it's still split up into zones. But it's not split up into zones in the sense that it requires a loading screen. It's just split, it's just kind of sectioned off in a sense. Like I don't Basically, you boot into the map, and you can go anywhere without having to transition via a loading screen after you've loaded it. I see. Uh, the, the net code in that is fan, is fan-fucking-tastic. It is, quite honestly, one of the best feedback loops I've ever gotten in anything. Like, playing Monster Hunter is like playing really anything challenging. Like... When, when you slay a monster in Monster Hunter, you carve up their body and you get their materials. So you might get like some horns or some scales, stuff like that. And then you take it to the blacksmith and you use those items to make new weapons and armor. And that's really that feels really good. And then you can fight progressively stronger monsters. Like, when you first start off, you're extremely weak. But then you can go back to that area and maybe fight the monster that was giving you a bunch of shit earlier and kill it super fast. Like, you're not going to be killing it in one or two hits, but now you, not only do you have the strategy down now that you fought it, but you also have better equipment. Uh, so my roommate and I have been playing a lot of that. The multiplayer feels great. Um, I play an archer because I like playing ranged, uh, ranged DPS, and I found that the guns in Monster Hunter are great, but you need to buy or craft a lot of ammo to make them very effective, whereas with the arrows you just buy or make coatings and they're kind of cheap. Plus each bow only can only use certain uh, certain types of coating. Whereas my roommate plays uh, with what is called a hunting horn, so he's a support class. He's a melee support class. Uh, so we are currently, I believe seven or eight hunts in so we're not very far in but we've been kind of playing it together and it's it's a great party experience if you have friends who like this kind of thing and you know even if you don't i found that the single player experience can also be very rewarding because you're not expecting a game like this to be uh i wouldn't say easy but you would expect it to be unfair if you're playing by yourself especially if you're playing a ranged class like me because most of these monsters are very agile and get up in your face but i found that it's really like it's just good it feels good it feels right um it's not quite on the level of it i i would argue that the gameplay is not as unique as some of its counterparts like tokiden or soul sacrifice but I would definitely say that what game, like everything else about it, is so polished and so perfected that it is not just a perfect Monster Hunter game. I would argue that it would be a ten out of ten. Like I, I have not encountered any problems with it yet in my brief time playing it. So does the game have a uh, an online co op feature too, or no? Yes, it does. We don't do couch co-op. It's all it's all online. He has a PlayStation Four in his room, and I have mine in the living room. Oh, really? So even though you guys. Live in the same house. You don't. You don't do couch co-op at all. Uh, no. Oh, I see. No, not usually. Um, we were originally thinking about a little tangent for our listeners is that when Zelda Breath of the Wild came out, my roommate sunk more hours into that than anything else I've ever seen him play, and he plays video games a lot as well. But uh, he came up with an idea where each person gets one Joy-Con and has to control one half of Link. So one person is the movement, and one person is the actions. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> now, we planned to do this and do it drunk. Oh, God. Because, of course, we're both, al we're both horrible alcoholics. 
Uh, I rejected that idea immediately because I thought that while it was interesting, I would also shove a Joy-Con down his throat on stream. That would be the greatest Let's Play ever, though, probably. Oh, it'd be hilarious. He's been playing through Master Mode recently, and that shit is just ridiculous. That could be something like you could do with uh, Super Mario Odyssey, where you could fucking... Uh, one person plays Mario and one person controls Cappy. Yeah, we've been thinking about that, One too, of you could just like... be a complete asshole. He hasn't been into that for whatever reason. Like he hasn't been, he hasn't touched Mario Odyssey nearly as much as I have. Like I finished it. Really? Well, I've I've gotten the first ending for like uh, what is it like two hundred power moons or one hundred and twenty or something? Two fifty. Is it? Yeah, it's to get to the the final. Because then after that, you have to get like three hundred more. Yeah, the to get the true final ending, you have to get five hundred. Okay. Yeah, I gotta finish it then. But uh, since this is more of like a mini review, and I'm sure you know you'll probably write a more in depth review for Jotaku, maybe. Probably once I once I get that Dragon Ball Fighters one out, like I've been trying to crank it out, but the words won't come. Right. So uh, as of right now, you you said you'd give the game a ten, or do you think it, it doesn't deserve a ten quite yet? You know what? Actually, if I'm completely honest, I'd say it's about a nine, and the only reason that it it, it is is because. Although there is there are no networking issues, it's very cumbersome to actually play with friends. Like uh, I, for for example, you can make a squad of yourself and your friends, and then you can either create a what is a, called a squad session, which is like. You make an online session, but you automatically invite squad members, or they can automatically like get into it from the start menu. Or uh, you can invite them with the PS4's uh, invite feature. But both of those are extremely cumbersome to do. Like They're just kind of a pain in the ass. On top of that, there's another issue where uh, you can just go into an area without accepting a quest, and it's called an expedition. But if you and I are in the same lobby, and we both go on an expedition, we won't see each other. Like, each expedition seems to be a self-contained thing unless you finish a quest and return to camp instead of returning to the the lobby. Huh. So even if you're doing the same one, you won't see each other? No, like, if you're doing the same area, you won't. That's Which is weird. Yeah, that's weird. But there are ways around it. It's just kind of like a, a little vexing thing, I think. So do you think, uh, I know it's still, it's way too early to call, but do you think Monster Hunter World deserves a Game of the Year nomination? I I really don't know. I would have to wait and see what else comes out this year. It, you know what, I think that for, for what it is, I think that it really should get one. But I also know that, kind of like Persona, Monster Hunter is an extremely niche thing that is just starting to become more and more popular like until i introduced people to persona and shin megami tensei they'd never heard of it and monster hunter is the first monster hunter game that people outside of my friend circle have been talking about really yeah so even if you think it does get a nomination chances are it's not gonna win uh, unfortunately i don't think so i see i hope so but i, I hope so but i don't necessarily think so <laughs> Uh, so I, I didn't give you any of these links, right, for the Nintendo s uh, news no. things? No, you didn't. All right. Well, the first one we're going to talk about, and it's it's quite small, so I'm just going to get it out of the way. Uh, for anybody out there who enjoys Fire Emblem Heroes, the smartphone game, there is an update that I believe is out already. It started February... F February... First, I think. Fire Emblem First Anniversary has training maps, a rhythm game mode, and loads of orbs. So, um, Nintendo held an Fire, Hem Fire Emblem Heroes channel live stream today. Well, not today. This was, was Thursday. Uh, I'm reading this off the article, of course. Showing off what sort of anniversary celebrations are in store. For the nearly one-year-old Fire Emblem Heroes game. Firstly, there will be a login bonus and double XP 
and SP starting February 1st, 2018. There are also a set of 25 daily maps, each based on one banner from the first year of the game. Each map has two difficulties to play, normal and hard. Uh, there will be there will also be a 50 orb anniversary present from February 1st. Uh, for the celebration, players can receive up to 100 orbs for summoning. Uh, from today, February 3rd, there will be new developer challenge maps to test players' wits uh, added every day. A new Grand Hero Battle revival will feature each day starting February 8th um, <clears throat> alongside new GH8 or GHB Elite Quests, Xander, who hasn't had a revival featured yet, will re-debut here with an Infernal Difficulty map. Special training maps will also be featured every day starting February 8th. Each day will reveal a different map suited to train different types of heroes and have many reinforcements similar to the Fire Emblem Warriors maps. Coupled with double SP and double XP events, players can easily train up their desired heroes. A new Hero Fest banner will debu uh, debut has debuted February 1st. The banner has an, an increased 5% focus initial appearance rate and features Brave Hero Ike, Brave Hero Lin, ooh, I need to get that, uh, and Nephany. I probably pronounced that wrong, and Sigurd. Also, a new mode called Tag Battle. Illusory Dungeon will feature in February. It plays similar to the to the Fiat Rhythm game as the screen needs to be tapped in the beat with the oncoming enemies. The Illusionary The Illusory Dungeon has 100 floors with different modes and difficulties. The Battle Illusory D Dungeon will be available from February 8th to February 22nd. Floor 41 and up unlock over time starting February 9th. So, that's it. That's a pretty big update uh, for uh, the first year of the game. Yeah, I think that really shows a lot of support and dedication. I'm not really interested in gotcha-style games like... I played Fate Grand Order for the first time, like, over the holidays. Like, dedicated Fate Grand Like, I, I played it before, but uh, I, I just... They're not really for me, you know what I mean? Yeah, I get it. And with, with Fire Emblem Heroes, it is a very faithful recreation of Fire Emblem, in my opinion. It's just, like I said, it's just something that, like... There are other things that I enjoy more so... Like, if I'm going to play a phone game, I'm I'm going to play, like, Tetris or Pac-Man or any of those 80s arcade games. Right. Which I know sounds kind of weird, but Gotcha, to me, feels at once good, depending on what the game is behind it. But it also feels like an extremely predatory system. Like, some of the whale, some of the stories about, like, whales that come out of, uh, like, Fate Grand Order and Fire Emblem, that's crazy, man. Yeah. I mean, to me, I treat these games as, like, time wasters if I'm out somewhere. And That's fair. Like when I play Dokkan Battle, uh, DBZ Dokkan Battle, once I like reach my limit in that game, and like there's, I'm out of stamina, and I don't want to waste one of my summoning stones to refill stamina, then I'll just hop to the next game. You know, do some things, run out of stamina. Next game, you know, I only play like two Gotcha games, and then I have yeah. the I have the classic Sonic games on my phone. So even if I want to, I'll just play one of those. How are those ports, by the way? Because they're free on the... the oh Android my god, dude. Right Sonic 2's port is so good. Especially the special stages. It's in 60, 60 frames per second. Huh. It is glorious. From, like, the choppy 20 frames per second you got on the uh, Genesis and all of those faithful uh, ports. Like, the phone version is so good. And also, Sonic CD is currently free to download on iOS. Just saying. No, I don't have an iPhone, though. I'll check the, the Google Play Store. Kind of an achievement to talk about here. The Nintendo Switch has officially surpassed the Wii U in worldwide unit sales. 
The Nintendo Switch has officially surpassed the Wii U, and life-to-date sales as Nintendo shared an updated look at the hardware sales figures as of December 31st, 2017. Uh, the Wii U only sold 13.56 million units uh, worldwide in its uh, lifespan. The Switch already sold 14.86 million units worldwide in less than a year. Huh. While the Nintendo 3DS worldwide has sold 72 million units worldwide uh, lifetime so far. Um, Software-wise, the Switch has sold 52.57 million games in less than a year. Now, I think they have a chance. If if the Switch continues to do well, I think it has a chance to beat out the GameCube's lifetime sales, uh, which was 21.74 million. That was also a pretty bad sales figures. Uh, the N64, I think it'll beat out the N64 as well. That sold a lifetime total of 32.93 million units. And I think it it could beat the SNES as well, which sold a lifetime of 49.1 uh, total units. So what do you think about that? You think the Switch could be like the their second or third most popular console? I think it honestly has the potential to be their most popular by the time it ends its lifespan. So you think uh, you think they'll sell over a hundred million units? I think they. I realistically because. Here's the thing, right? It's their fastest selling console to, to date. date. Yep. It has portable functionality, which I think is a huge deal. Like, I, I genuinely think that Nintendo is going to hope. I hope that Nintendo creates a new trend of hybrid consoles. I know they probably won't, because the PS4 and the Xbox like to be very powerful. And when you have portability, you sacrifice some of that. But. <clears throat> I kind of hope that they kill they kill the portable market, not because I think the portable market is bad per se, but because like why not make these hybrid consoles? These hybrid consoles are brilliant. Sure, the Switch is a little bit bulky, but uh, regardless, I also think that that portability has a lot to do with it. I think that you know they've already released a very wide array of games that are really good on it. Um with more in the future, like continued Nintendo support of this console will continue to sell this console. Like if, when we get the next Kirby, if we haven't already gotten it, I don't think we have that. That's, that might be a console seller for some people. Or if we get, you know, those Ace Attorney games that I talked about in our most anticipated games, that might be a console seller for some people. Especially when you consider that some of the stuff that we're getting on this console are ga- are games that would otherwise be considered portable. Like, Ace Attorney was originally designed on the GBA. And then it went right? to the DS. And then it went to DS and the eShop. Right. Um, the only thing I think the Switch is lacking that would make it probably the greatest buy that anyone could make at this point, and this is speak- I'm speaking as it's someone who will defend the PS4 with their life, uh, would be virtual console, like proper virtual console support. Yeah, right now the virtual console is a fucking disaster. I don't even think there is one. I haven't seen any classic games in the eShop. There will be starting in September, uh, and I'm, we're going to get into that shortly. Oh, is that for the uh, the paid service? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's part of it. <laughs> oh, fuck. So, uh, to continue on... Talking about Nintendo's uh, success, Nintendo recently updated their list of top-selling games. Now, they have their their top seven here. Uh, I don't know why they just didn't stop at five. But here are their top... Extended to ten. Yeah, or extended to ten, exactly. Uh, So we'll we'll go from least amount of sales to the most. And I'm sure you could already predict which one is number one. Well, it's Mario and then Zelda, and I can't remember what the third one is because someone recently told me about this. It's the last, isn't it, for three? So, number seven is Xenoblade Chronicles 2, selling 1.06 million uh, copies. Okay. And these are both digital and retail sales, by the way. 
Uh, number six is ARMS at 1.61 1 million units. Uh, one two switch surprisingly is number five at one point eighty eight million uh, units. Splatoon two is number four at four point ninety one uh, million units. Number three is Breath of the Wild at six point seven million units. Number two is Mario Kart eight Deluxe at seven point thirty three million. And number one, of course, Super Mario Odyssey at nine point zero seven million sold. So that means. That means about three quarters of the people that bought a Switch bought Mario Odyssey. Not surprising. And the game is only three months old. Yeah, that's, I'm not surprised. Like when that's a lot of sales for a game in three months. As I gotta be honest, as much as I hated the Wii when I owned it, which was to the point where I didn't buy a Wii U, I I seriously considered buying a Wii U. For some of the stuff that came out on it. I did buy a Wii first U for some of the stuff that came out on it. <laughs> first party Nintendo titles are console sellers. They really are. Like, even the Wii, which only had a handful of good games on it. Most of which were first party Nintendo titles. Um, even that could have been sold for, like, you know, Twilight Princess, uh... The two Super Mario Galaxy games, Mario Kart, shit, uh, Mario Party, shit like that. Maybe Donkey Kong Country Returns. I haven't played it, so I can't really. Comment I, wa on I watched a Let's probably. Play of it. It it was a pretty good game from what I watched. Okay. So, did you ever buy a Wii, or did you skip over it? Uh, well, fun fun story. Uh, I come from a fairly wealthy family, and my parents kind of spoiled me as a kid. Plus, my grandmother and grandfather kind of lived down the road. So, I think I was eight or nine. And my grandmother just randomly comes over, and she's like, hey, I got you a present. Here's a Wii. You probably wanted like, to slap her. <laughs> Honestly, the Wii was really cool when it first came out. Like, it was very... Once the novelty of the Wii wore off, it was kind of a waste but the Wii itself was kind of neat for the first couple of months. See, I never hated the console itself. I just hated the fact that you had to use motion controls for like 95% of the games that were, you know, that were actually good on the console. Yeah. And I just didn't want to do that stupid shit. Um, which is why I'm glad the Switch and even the Wii U, when they had the motion controls in their games, were optional. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Wii, it was, like, fucking mandatory. And yeah, like, I, motion controls at that point were very unrefined and not very good. See, I'm one I'm one that skipped over the Wii and got a Wii U because of some of the games that were on the Wii U. <coughs> That's fair. Like, when I bought my Wii U, uh, the Wii, it was a little over a year old, almost a year and a half old. And... Yeah, I bought it in March of 2014, I believe. I have the video on my channel of uh, an unboxing yeah. of it. Uh, I bought Super Mario... It, well, it came with Super New Super Mario Bros. Uh, U and the Super Luigi U uh, DLC download. Uh, it came with that. I bought Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. And I bought Super Mario 3D World, which... 3D World, by the way, is a fantastic game. Even if it's not a great 3D Mario game, it's still a great Mario platformer. Okay. And, you know, then I played Smash Bros. when that came out. At the, uh, near the end of 2014, you know, Mario Maker 2015. Uh, Pokemon Tournament 2016, which I was not all that impressed with. Which is why mm -hmm. I skipped over the Switch version. Uh, and then, that was it. I never played Bayonetta 2, even though I wanted to, which is... Now I'm glad it's re you know releasing again on the on the Switch because now I have a shot to play it again. Yeah, uh, and that's it. Like I told you before, I played eight titles on the Wii U. That was it. That's what I bought my Wii U for. Eight fucking games. <laughs> but uh, yeah, man, I hope uh, the Switch continues to do well. I've always said they needed to have a great first year, and for the way Nintendo has been going, I don't think they could have asked for a better first year. Oh, definitely. And I think that the thing about the, the Switch is that, like, 
the Wii also had a very good first year. A lot of people bought a Wii really, really quickly. Oh, yeah. But unlike the Wii, the Switch is something that third-party developers are willing to develop for. And you can tell just by the sheer number of ports. Like, sure, you know what? Dark Souls is an old game. But the fact that they're when they when the remaster comes out, it's getting ported to Switch. That that shows that speaks volumes to me, or the fact that you know we have Skyrim on it. Like I hate Skyrim and I hate that it's on every console, but Skyrim is not a terribly easy game to run. Although at this point, I'm pretty sure that if Bethesda could get it to run on a calculator, they they would. <laughs> So do you think with the slower and certainly lesser uh, lesser name Switch games coming out this year, do you think that'll slow the console's uh, success a little bit, or do you think it, it could you could see it like running strong again this year? Uh, it really depends. Like I think that I think that people who bought say Bayonetta one. Are gonna might buy it again on the Switch. Uh, if they own a Switch, like, but when it comes to console sales, it's really dependent on what else is coming out that might catch somebody's eye. Right. Like if if you own say a 3DS, and you like Ace Attorney, you might buy the Ace Attorney collections for the Switch when they come out because there I think there's two of them planned for one, two, three, and then four, five, and six. So it's kind of a matter of like how much crossover appeal is there that might be a console seller. Because so far the games we know that are coming out this year for the Switch, we have the new Kirby game, uh, Kirby Star Allies. We have the new Yoshi game, which is still just called Yoshi at this point. Uh, we have Bayonetta 1, 2, and 3 all coming out this year. Uh, we have a new Fire Emblem, uh, core Fire Emblem game, coming to the Switch this year. We might get Metroid Prime, Metroid Prime 4. We mm -hmm. might get the new Pokemon, uh, core Pokemon game. If we, you know, when that comes out, the 3DS is dead, no matter what, when the new Pokemon comes out. Oh, yeah. Out. Um, there's one other game I was thinking of. There are, and there are rumors, you know, swirling around uh, that we may see uh, Smash Bros. this year, which I don't think is going to happen. And then we also getting the ports of Tropical Freeze and Hyrule Warriors to the Switch this year as well. Well, given what some of these games are, people who own a 3DS are pretty much kind of forced into it if they want to continue to support Nintendo. Like, if if you like, say, Fire Emblem Echoes, which I haven't played, I haven't or played it Fire Emblem Fates, which I haven't played, or Fire Emblem Awakening on your 3DS, well, guess what? There probably won't be any more 3DS Fire Emblem games. Like, the 3DS is pretty much dead. I think the only thing that's coming out in the in the next couple of months that is even worth talking about, and now keep in mind, this is my opinion, and it's a very niche opinion, is uh, Shin Megami Tensei Strange Journey Redo. Uh, let me just check the 3DS release schedule. Yeah, I was about to do the same thing. <laughs> like, I, I just, I don't... A lot of what's coming out appear to be, like, indie games. Dragon Quest Builders already exists on console. Radiant History is pretty good, though. I would highly recommend that anyone get that. Um, oh, I guess you... What the fuck? Oh, I'm just crazy. Okay, because for a minute there, um, it's not filtering out by console right now. Like, I just put it as everything. I have, yeah, a, li so I have a list up here. I've got a list of uh, six, and the only ones that are really have really caught my eye are Radiant Historia, which comes out next week. Uh, Detective Pikachu, which comes out next month. Uh, and then Shin Megami sent, uh, Tensei Strange Journey Redo. And the Alliance Alive. Like, maybe people would get Shovel Knight King of Cards, but I don't necessarily think that, that would be, you know, a console seller, per se. The list I'm looking at doesn't even show Shovel Knight on here. 
Oh, I'm on the uh, I'm on Nintendo Nintendo.com. Oh, okay. Because the list I have has all the other games except for the one you met, uh, the Shovel Knight. Yeah, there's uh, also uh, Raining Coins and uh, and Operation Cobra, but I've never heard of either of those. So realistically, you have a, a literally a small handful of games coming for the 3DS this year. The console's practically dead already. I'm kind of glad, honestly. Like I said, like, man, they had to kill the console. They just had to. I'm kind of sad to see it go, though, because I I just got my 3DS back from home, and I kind of wanted to buy a new 3, like one of the new 3DSs with the uh, the dual analog. Right. Mostly because there are some games that are currently on 3DS that won't be coming to Switch that I really want to play. <clears throat> um, in particular, like. Uh, Shin Megami Tensei 4 Apocalypse is coming out, or has come out. Uh, I missed I missed a lot of stuff. Like, Metroid Samus Returns came out a while ago. That seems really good. Stuff like that. Also, also, I, do, do we know who is uh, currently voicing Detective Pikachu? Wasn't it Robert Downey Jr.? Or is that only for the movie? Uh, it says Ryan Reynolds, actually. Oh, uh, Ryan Reynolds. See, that's what I meant. I knew it started with an a, with an R. Is that for uh, the game and the movie, or is that just the movie? Uh, I think it's just the movie. I'm I don't, not sure. I don't know why I thought Robert Downey Jr. It was the first name I just came up with with an R. But I know I knew his name. I knew it started with an R, though. So, well, the fact that it's not Danny DeVito makes me really sad. Although I hear Ryan Reynolds is, you know, Ryan Reynolds is not a bad actor. Oh, he's a good actor. Have you seen Deadpool? Yeah, I really loved good. fucking Deadpool, dude. I can't wait for the second one. Oh, fuck, have you seen the trailer where he's like Bob Ross? It's <laughs> Yeah, solid. they actually made a Funko Pop of that. <laughs> really? Oh my god. Yeah, De- Deadpool's Bob Ross. He has the big fucking afro on his head. <laughs> Holy shit. Um, Oops, I dropped my monster Pokeball, which I use for my Magnum moveset. <laughs> That was terrible. I'm sorry. My Jamie DeVito is really bad. Yeah, well, we all can't be great. I wasn't even trying, but like, it's it's not very good. So, do you want to talk about Nintendo Labo again? Not really, but I mean, it's your podcast, so I'm kind of <laughs> obligated to say yes. <laughs> oh shit! So, um, apparently, Nintendo announced that Nintendo Labo is not the only way. To play the in develop Nintendo C uh the <clears throat> let me start over. Nintendo Labro is not the only new way to play in develop. Nintendo CEO Tatsumi Kimishima announced uh at a news conference that Nintendo Labo is not the only new measure coming to the Nintendo Switch. As more is on the way in order to appeal to a wider range of customers. Without elaborating, sources close to development side also mention that there will be other new peripheral devices for the Nintendo Switch. At the same conference, Kimishima also stated that Nintendo expects to sell nearly 3 million Labo units in the current quarter and is targeting for 20 million units for the fiscal 2018 year starting April of this year. So, Nintendo is expecting to sell 20 million Labo units. Mm. And the only way to to do that, of course, Mm. is to sell that many consoles. (laughs) You cut out for a second there. Oh, uh, what I was saying was... uh, 20 million units, that's the last thing I got. Yeah, the only way way they're going to sell 20 million Labo units is to sell that many consoles, obviously. Fuck. Well, they're gonna have to sell more because I know for a fact I'm not buying one. I think the idea is fucking. Like, I know we discussed this uh, when they were announced. I've since rethought my stance on it. I'm not gonna buy one because I think it's a fucking stupid gimmick. I could, yeah. I mean, I, I've said it was gimmicky as hell. I don't I think, think it's, it's, it's Nintendo, and I'm willing to give them the benefit of a doubt. But if it becomes like the the main thing that the Switch has going for it, and most first party Nintendo games require some. 
oh, sort of Labo functionality, I'd be pissed. I will actually gouge out my own eyes. I'll be pissed if uh, Nintendo, you know, makes this a staple of their games. I really hope not. I um, hope they learn from the Wii and the Wii U. You know, like I said, I don't think it's a stupid idea. I think it's something you could have, you know, more fun with if you had like a a younger sibling or a nephew or a niece, you know, to play with it with them and to help them build this stuff. You know, but obviously us as adults, you know, we're not going to play with this stuff ourselves. Speaking of families, at the press conference, Nintendo reports uh, they have been getting positive responses for Nintendo Labo, especially from families. Hmm. Nintendo surprised us with a new form of uh, new form of play. With Nintendo Labo first uh, last month, company president Tatsumi Kimishima had more to share about it in the company's latest f uh, financial results briefing. Uh, <clears throat> looking ahead at the next stage for Nintendo and Nintendo Switch, we believe we need to offer very Nintendo-like new forms of play. One of those efforts is Nintendo Labo, or Labo, which we announced just the other day. Uh, no, it wasn't just announced the other day. Uh, writer of this article. Consumers around the world who watched this video, who watched the video had generally favorable responses, including some who voiced delighted surprise that Nintendo had once again done the unexpected. The release is set for April 20th, so this was just a teaser to unveil the product. We will introduce full particulars for Nintendo Labo over the course of the weeks ahead through hands-on events and a variety of promotional activities by Nintendo. The responses by families to Nintendo Labo Studio hands-on events has been tremendous. In just four days following the release of the Nintendo Labo video applications, outstripped uh, space 50 fold in the US. The rate of applications to space was extremely high in other markets as well. As also looking forward to directly experiencing the response of consumers to the hands on events. Nintendo Labo is a product intended to broaden the possibilities of Nintendo Switch. We hope to develop Nintendo Labo into a product that is not bound by the con by the conventional boundaries of video games and that endears itself to an even broader range of consumers. Oh, um, by the way, if you want to see people get hands-on with uh, Nintendo Labo, check out Game Explain. They released a video the other day. Uh, they mm -hmm. got hands-on with it. And, uh, yeah, they talk about what they thought of it and, and stuff like that, so... I can certainly say that the positivity, I have seen it uh, personally on Nintendo's uh, Facebook page. A lot of people had a lot of good things to say about it the day the video came out. I see. So are you not surprised that families and people are giving this a good, good feedback and like good ratings? Or did you think this uh... would get more backlash? I'm going to wait and see. I'm not surprised the families like it. Families really enjoyed the Wii, too. That's why but it like sold so well. <laughs> it's a question of whether the novelty of the label will wear off. Kind of like the, the Wii. It's the same thing that I mentioned earlier. It's like the Wii was cool when you got it because it was really innovative to play with motion controls. Right? Right. And then once that novelty wore off, people started to give a shit. St stopped giving a shit, rather. However, what I'll, in my personal experience, my my parents, my parents, my grandparents, and like my aunt and uncle never played video games growing up. Like my dad played like PS2, but my mom was never really that into it. And everybody in our family enjoyed playing the Wii. Everybody liked playing Wii Sports. So I think the la the label might be the same kind of principle principle where it's like for some people the hype will die off but the experience of playing it as a family and the novelty will not die for some people for a long time 
So you think this this could be a success, you know, only because like families are going to get into it pretty much. Pretty much, but I also think that Nintendo is a very family friendly company, and that that is kind of their target audience in general. Like, it pretty much always has been, at least for the longest time now. Nintendo is to video games what Coca Cola is to soda. And I can't, like, I can't so, go without my Coke. <laughs> I pre- I prefer Dr Pepper, honestly, or like ginger ale. There's some really good like East Coast Canadian only like brands of ginger ale. You can't get them anywhere else in the country. Fuck me, they're good. <laughs> That's what I mix with my alcohol, because it's just the best. I actually just bought two cases of soda today. I bought a case of Coke and a case of uh, Sunkissed Orange. I've never had uh, the, the latter. Uh, Sunkissed Orange is good stuff. Never had it. So, um, speaking of the 3DS, as I said, uh, in this uh, financial briefing, Nintendo discussed the status of the 3DS and its future in parallel to the Switch business. You mean it's lack thereof? <laughs> <laughs> in the latest financial results briefing, Nintendo President Kimishima discussed the status of the Nintendo 3DS family business and plans moving forward in parallel with the Nintendo Switch. Um, and it shows a, um, you know, there's a, sh- there's a chart here uh, showing how uh, sales throughout uh, 2017... Uh, the graphic, the graphic shows changes in the 3DS hardware sell through, as a total for the Japanese, U.S., and European markets combined. Uh, though sales are trending lower than last year, the results from our seventh holiday season sales have maintained stable levels, as explained during the financial results briefing in October of last year. The 3DS family of hardware has continued. To sell steadily without significant fall off, even after the release of the Switch. Uh, and then there's a bar graph here showing uh, sales, and uh, it, uh, the 3DS actually sold the best in Europe. Huh. Um. Continue business backed by scale of market update, uh, ample software lineup. The 3DS characteristics. Price point, uh, price points, and play style differ from the Switch, and we intend to continue the uh, 3DS business separately and in parallel. We will continue to use its installed base and rich software library in our business. And then it lists uh, some of the uh, 3DS's uh, most, you know, top selling games. Uh. And that's pretty much it. So, uh, according to them, they're going to keep the 3DS alive. But with the, some of the games coming out on the on the Switch, I don't see how they're going to be able to do that. I think they're going to try, but I think that the the market is going to decide that, like, no. Oh. Nintendo can try to support it all they want, but I think that the people have kind of already spoken. And the developers have already kind of spoken that, like, the 3DS is on its way out. So I think this is a really bad idea, and that they should just kind of let it die. Yeah, I mean, like, like we, you know, like we said before, we went, we went over the list of upcoming 3DS games, and there's practically nothing there. Yeah. So, uh, continuing with the briefing, uh, by the way, all of this news uh, is, the rest of this news is from the briefing. The next piece of business, Nintendo Online Service, is stated to begin September 2018. Uh, after initially announced for the Switch Online Service to start in fall of 2017, Nintendo shared its latest financial results briefing that it will start in September 2018. Uh, and I quote, Work in progress on ways to further heighten the gaming experience for consumers. Details will be made available as they are finalized. 
Uh, the Nintendo Switch online service starts September 2018, uh, as we just noted in the quote, and will be free until then. The pricing is at $20 a year, which is pretty cheap, and you can check out what else it offers in uh, previous reports. Now, the only thing that they've really made clear is the mm -hmm. fact that they're going to have older games available. With like new online, uh, new like online features like online leaderboards and stuff like that. To be honest, if they want to start charging for the Switch service, they need to have a better Nintendo eShop on the Switch. Definitely. They need to start bringing in the Virtual Console, and they need to just start adding more functionality to the console you know that the Wii U had that the Switch still doesn't have and they need to make sure that their online play is pretty good so what would what would you hope to expect from this uh, Nintendo online service um, uh, honestly I kind of just hope that they here, here's what I want. I'm gonna be, I'm just no holds barred with this. I want it's twenty bucks a month, so I don't expect to get a lot. But one thing I would like is once they do the virtual console, I'd like to get at least one free virtual console game every month because Sony does it and Xbox does it. Right, and I think that's what they're gonna do. Uh, I just hope that they don't take the game away from you after the month and then switch it out with a different one. I hope they let you keep it. Well, that's what Sony and Microsoft do, is they don't they switch out the games on the store, but as long as you have the content license for it, like as long as your membership is still good, you can keep playing it. Right. Or reinstall it if you want to. That's what I'm hoping Nintendo does. Yeah. And I think that for twenty bucks, like it's not it doesn't cost them much, if anything, for them to give us like Super Mario Bros. three. Like that's like a two dollar game. <clears throat> I think actually Mario Three was like the first title they showed for this online service last year. Really? Yeah, it's gonna have like online leaderboards and stuff, so now you can like compete for like the highest score or like fastest clear times on stages and stuff. That's really neat. I also kind of hope that they. Uh... This is gonna sound really weird coming from me of all people, but I really want like a trophy system. Yeah, what dude, the, I've been has. I've been wanting that on Nintendo consoles since the Wii U, dude. Like, I I think that achievements are kind of bullshit. Like, gamer score doesn't mean anything, but I feel good when I get one. Yeah, it's just like the feeling you get from like doing it. And sometimes it can teach you interesting stuff about the game that you didn't already know. Or it like makes you like it causes replayability because like. Some people want to go back and either get them all, or they want to try to get, you know, try to play the game again on a harder difficulty, or yeah. some of them make you go out of your way and explore, where you might not have normally done that. Well, like for Fighters, for example, when we uh, discussed that, I'm currently 60% of the way there. I'm about 68 myself. Because there are a few trophies that, like, because of the current online situation, I'm not able to get right now. Right. Yeah, I already I got all of those. I need the arena match ones. Yeah, I got those already. I got those. I got custom. Uh, working on the ranked. Well, that's about it. Okay, I've got the ranked and the casual. But anyway. Um, for example, like I might not have spent as much time doing uh, combo challenges if that wasn't an achievement. It is. And those combo challenges have taught me game valuable game mechanics and character information. Did I lose you? Oh, huh? no, I'm still here. Sorry, I thought I think you might have cut out for a second on my end, but I'm not sure. Yeah, it kind of did. Like, the last thing you said was, like, you taught you, uh, you know, some some of the game mechanics, and then it, like, went oh, silent no, it's, for a it, few it teaches you game mechanics, or sometimes it might just be, like, fun stuff that you didn't really know was possible or put in the game beforehand. Right. Like, uh, in, for example, in Yakuza 0, there are some, there's, I think, one trophy every two chapters that's, like, a hidden trophy, but it's usually stuff that you didn't necessarily know would net you a different reaction. Sure, they're missable, 
but they they're kind of interesting to get. Like one of them is you have to give uh, hobos a bunch of drinks, and they they are actually homeless people. And if you give one of them expensive champagne, you get this achievement. But it also leads to kind of like a a very short but very fun and funny little exchange between the main character and this homeless guy. Right. So there's stuff like that that's really good. Yeah, dude, I've been hoping Nintendo got like a trophy or an achievement system since the Wii U days. I mean, it, well, obviously, like... you they can't call it trophies or they can't call it achievements. But like, you know how Nintendo's have made like a big deal with stamps already. That's what I was gonna say. Is they'll probably call them stamps because um, yeah, call them stamps the or medals. Game, the, the first game that I can think of that called them stamps was uh, Wii Sports Resort. I think there were stamps in Wii Sports Resort. Whatever, Wii Sports Resort basically had an achievement system built into the game, and I'm surprised Nintendo didn't make it a part, like a console-wide thing, then and there. They're, they, yeah, because they have some games that have them built in. Like Hyrule the Warriors one is thing. one, uh, Fire Emblem Warriors, and Mario Odyssey have uh, in-game achievement lists. Yeah, but one thing I do hope that Nintendo doesn't do, that uh, Sony and Microsoft do, is if you're going to port your old games to the system, like, for, for Sony, for example, it's like PS2 to PS4 for P, uh, for your PS4. Right. And for, I don't know how it is for Xbox, but I know that on PS, uh, if you're going to port a PS2 game to the PS4, it needs to have a very specific resolution, to my knowledge, and the one thing it, it absolutely must have is trophy support. Right. And on the PS4, I think the lo- a lot of the PS2 ports have gotten the trophy treatment at least. All of them have. It's a requirement that you need to have trophy support. That's okay. why all of the PS4 games that uh, are currently there, there's not an equal number between the PS3 classics and the PS4 classics. If that makes sense? Like, right. the PS3 doesn't have trophy support for any of those PS2 games. Or the PS1 games, for that matter. Yeah, but there's like four times as many. Actually, there's probably more now. But, like, uh, yeah, I hope Nintendo doesn't do that, where it's, like, you're going to have to pay $9 for Mario because Nintendo made somebody add metal or stamp support to it. Like, that's bullshit. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, uh, there's two more things to talk about here, and uh, then before we end it, I'll see if there's anything else before we finish things up. Okay. Let's go back to mobile gaming, shall we? Oh, God. Uh, Also, in the... In the uh, briefing, Nintendo announced a new mobile game uh, called Mario Kart uh, Mario Kart Tour. It will launch by the fiscal year ending in March of 2019. Uh, not much is known about this game right now. Uh, there is a logo for the game. Uh, Nintendo of America made a tweet. Uh, it says the checkered flag has been raised and the finish line is near. A new mobile app is now in development, Mario Kart Tour, releasing in the fiscal year ending in March 2019. Uh, Mario Kart Tour is in development for iOS and Android devices. More more information will be revealed later. So literally nothing is known about this game right now other than the announcement and the logo. And who knows, this might not even be the final logo. Hmm. So okay. I know you're not big on mobile games, and what do you think of an actual like a Mario Kart game going on mobile? Gas up your go kart, five ninety nine. <laughs> you want to unlock that metal Mario, five ninety nine. You want to get mirror tracks, five ninety nine. I know Nintendo probably may not do that. Well, I mean, they had Super Mario Run, and uh, they actually made it really easy. To mm-hmm. to get like the the online play tickets so that you actually didn't have to buy them through microtransactions. Okay. So I'm hoping Nintendo does the same with this game. But you know what what kind of play style do you think it'll be? Do you think it could be like what we see now in Mario Kart 8 with the 3D racing style? Do you think it it'll be like a top down uh, game? Mm. Or or what do you think it could possibly be? I don't know, man. Uh, modern phones are powerful enough to render 3D. So, like, 
that's what I would hope, but I also think that control schemes are really hard for that. Like, it's hard, it's harder to be precise with either touch or tilt controls. Right. And not only that, but, like, how would you drift? Because there's, there's no buttons on a phone, you know, to yeah, do things true. like that. Unless you would have to tap the screen, and then you'd have to, like, hold... I don't know how you would do it, like, tap the screen, and then maybe you'd have to hold your finger in a certain way to, to do a drift around a corner. Yeah, that just sounds really awkward to me. Like, I don't know how they would do it. This literally caught me off guard. I would never have expected a Mario Kart game on a, on a phone. To be fair, though, uh, were you really expecting Super Mario Run either? I mean, not exactly, but when Nintendo said they were going to start um, working with uh, smartphones and stuff, I kind of mm. had a feeling there was going to be some kind of a Mario game, you know, on the phone. That's so, fair. I kind of expected something, but not like a, uh, not like one of those endless runner type games. Yeah. <clears throat> so. Again, not much, really nothing is known about this game, and uh, we'll talk about it more as details are uh, made, you know, made available. So, uh, final tidbit for today, I believe. We talked uh, recently, a few episodes back, about the Super Mario movie being a rumor. Uh, the, yeah. the movie is officially greenlit. Nintendo has teamed up with Illumination Studios for the animated Mario film, co-produced by Shigeru Miyamoto. Uh, Illumination Studio uh, is the is the uh, studio most famous for working on the Despicable Me and Minions movies. And Minions, yeah. So that's the company that we're going to get the Mario movie from. You know... I've heard Despicable Me is not actually that bad. It's not. I'm just not crazy about the art style and whatnot. I've never seen it. Uh, but I also think that because of how they animate their characters, it might be very... Like, if they can emulate kind of the Nintendo-esque graphics, their animation will be really good. Like, their animation's really good and fitting for that kind of thing. Plus, if Miyamoto has a hand in it, then, like, that's fine. So it says, um, Nintendo announced in partnership with Illumination Studio, the animation studio best known from Despicable Me for the Mario Bros. animated movie that will be co-produced by Shigeru Miyamoto, founder and CEO of Illumination Chris Melon Mel uh, Melandry will co-produce the film alongside Nintendo's representative director Shigeru Miyamoto. The film will be co co-financed by Universal Pictures and Nintendo, distributed theatrically worldwide by Universal Pictures. Uh, in a quote from Nintendo president uh, Tatsumi Kimishima uh, in the latest briefing for the fiscal year ending next month, um, how fitting that I actually chose to talk about this last, because this was the last thing they talked about. <laughs> Lastly, we will now introduce a new initiative to effectively use Nintendo IP. We have started development of an animated movie featuring Super Mario with Illumination, the movie studio that brought uh, such movies as Despicable Me and Minions. For the project, Mr. Chris Melendry, founder and CEO of Illumination, and Shigeru Miyamoto, representative director, uh, fellow of Nintendo, will be co-producing the film. The film will be co-financed by Nintendo Pictures, uh, Universal Pictures, and Nintendo distributed the theatrically worldwide. Further announcements on details such as release date will be made at a later date. We look forward to providing further information about the release timing for this movie that we hope everyone will enjoy. As a part, as a part of our effort to expand Nintendo IP beyond video games, we look forward to bringing smiles to people around the world through this movie now if this movie is going to have voice acting do you agree with me that they have to have charles martinet do mario's voice i mean nobody else could really take his place he's been doing it for how long 20 or 20 or 30 years now it, i think it's ever 30 years it's been i think ever since like 1995 i want to say I think it might have been before that. 
Like, it's been... I know he did it before Mario 64. Yeah, the first one he did was the Mario Early Years game. I believe okay. that came out in 1995 for PCs. So you're looking at about 23 years now, or, you know, going on 23 years? I mean, do you think Nintendo would replace Charles Martinet, or do you think they would be obligated to give it to him? Hmm. If, if, the, if it even has voice acting at all, since really the Minions really didn't have much voice acting at all. If it does, uh, hmm. Yeah, I think he's been kind of grandfathered into it. I'm sorry, I had to take a second to think about that, but I, I can't really see anyone else being able to take his place at this point. I, I, I can't even. Even if they were to open auditions, I don't think they would find anyone who can do as good of a job. Have and you... if worse comes to worse, like, Mario himself doesn't talk all that often. Right. It's the characters around him that <laughs> that do. <coughs> like, even in Mario Odyssey, I don't, he doesn't, he only talk. he doesn't speak very often. Yeah, he never did. The most talking he ever did was in that PC game. <laughs> the, yeah. Uh, um, so what do you think like the animation would be like? Do you think uh, this would be a hell of a lot better of a Mario movie compared to that piece of shit that came out well over 20 years ago? Uh, I think that visually uh, it's going to look really good. I think that with Miyamoto's oversight, it has the potential to be a very good film otherwise. Because Nintendo... Okay, in my experience, when a company does this kind of stuff, and they have... Like, with their major property, and they care enough to have someone oversee it, especially when that person is the creator of it, things tend to turn out very faithfully and very good. Like... Miyamoto overseeing this is, to me, at the very least, is the equivalent of uh, Trey Parker and Matt Stone overseeing the two South Park games that we've gotten in the last few years. Right. And those are really good. They're very faithful to what South Park is. So I think that Miyamoto, other than the fact that there might... Other than the fact that there might be a few development problems, because Nintendo's very particular about their image and things like that, uh, I think that it has... You know, it'll be good. And let's uh, let's not forget how when uh, when they did that uh, Mario movie over twenty years ago, Nintendo just like sold rights to this to like a movie uh, movie studio. Yeah, they just let them do what they wanted. They yeah, they pretty much just let them do what they wanted. They didn't like you know uh, they didn't like quality control it, you know, like they really should have. And that movie was fucking awful. Yeah. And I mean, I feel bad for the actors that had to go through that movie. Because the script was always changing all the time, and you know it was known that the actors were fucking drinking scotch and whiskey, and just getting shit faced on stage while they're filming the movie and going through their lines and shit. How that movie even finished, I don't even know. Don't get me wrong, as a, as a proud alcoholic, I'm okay with that. <laughs> you know what? Some things are just too hard, man. Uh, ironically, I haven't had any to drink yet today. I was gonna say, so how sober are you this time? I'm gonna, I'm gonna make that a running joke. <laughs> Honestly, I am 100 percent sober right now. Sober cipher, everybody. You won't hear that often. No, no. Usually, usually I've had at least one. More often than not, it's more than one. So, and you think that? Especially. With, hmm? Go ahead. Oh, um, and you think with Miyamoto overseeing this movie, like? Miyamoto's Mr. Mario himself. He's not going to let this movie, you know, be shit. No. But I also think that Nintendo and Illumination might have very different ideas about what this could be. And it could be in development hell for a little while as a result. Oh, I, I really hope not. <laughs> I'm curious. I, I'll, I'll go see it when it comes out. Oh, absolutely. I'll, I'll be there fucking day one. Um, yeah. So what, what do you think about Un Universal Pictures uh, backing and distributing the movie? Do you think... Would you rather see, like, a different company, you know, backing this and, and like, being the company to distribute it? Like, uh, I don't know, would you would you rather see, I don't know, like, Sony? Well, I wouldn't say Sony Pictures. That'd be pretty fucking weird. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, Universal has released some pretty good movies, you know, over the years. So, yeah, I think, I think this... part of it... 
this like, has part the of the thing about good. Universal is that Universal also, you know, they had like a theme park, so I think this could lead to us getting some Mario theme stuff at Universal Studios. Which would be a very interesting uh, turn of events. It's already begun development in Japan. Fucking Christ. They're even well, They're even building with the Mario theme park. Uh, I believe it's going to be part of Universal. They're even okay. building a fully functioning Mario Kart track. Holy shit. I, I really want to go to this fucking theme park. And I, I hope one really- comes to America. There's so much stuff at Universal Japan that we don't get in the West that is super cool. Like, a lot of it's manga-themed. Like, they, they did um, the last couple of scenes from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 3 in 4D. Right. Uh, which was, like, you get to actually basically be there and experience it as if you were a character in the show. And it's it was apparently super accurate. Uh, they used to do, around Halloween, they would have uh, Resident Evil. Not quite a haunted house, but, like... Uh, they would give you a limited number of bullets and an objective that you'd have to get to. Stuff like that. I think I think it was at Universal. Yeah, man. I just hope, like, you know, the theme park's successful enough out there that they'd want to build one here. Mm-hmm. Because I would really love to uh, go to a Mario-themed or even a straight-up Nintendo-themed theme park. Yeah. Uh... So I'm just double checking real quick to see if there's any more news worth talking about. So far, I don't see anything. Anything, uh, you know, besides like little updates here and there. Uh, I don't see anything. Fire Emblem getting an arranged music collection. Call what? Is this a legit? Like OST? Hold on, let me look into this real quick. Uh... This is going to be in Japan only, isn't it? Probably. Yeah, it's Japan. Not surprised. Yeah, I mean, not to really go over it, but just to, just because I'm looking at it, might as well talk about it a little bit. So, um, there's a Fire Emblem series is getting a select OST soundtrack from various games in the series. Uh, this is apparently the second CD and concert project uh, and the theme of Flower of Enchantment in Sessions, uh, with songs being arranged to match symphonic metal theme Previous to the first arrangement collection, uh, went for a piano theme called Faith to Faith and Engagement. Um, yeah, and it's there's a Japanese trailer of the of the CD and whatnot. There's no release date for it though. Kind of interested, uh, being a fan of OSTs. Yeah. Um. Yeah, man, that's it. <coughs> yeah, we def yeah we definitely covered it all, man. We I think we wrapped up episode two quite nicely. You have any final thoughts on what we talked about? Yeah, I just realized because this was Nintendo themed, we should have started off instead of the usual stuff with "It's a me." Oh God, my body is my body was not ready for this episode. See, we we are limited to only one terrible impression a week. Well, and too I th- bad. I did two, and I didn't. I I did three today. I did John Lennon, Danny DeVito, and now Mario. <laughs> oh God, we yeah, we've definitely broken the bad impression uh, yeah. wall today. So, uh, I mean, if, you, if you'd like, I could start delivering my dialogue in a, a pretty good Russian or Irish accent. <laughs> it's a It's a pleasure to meet you. My name is Yuri. I am a terrible radio character. <laughs> I have been to space four times, once with a dog. <laughs> My cousin is Zangief from Street Fighter. <laughs> uh, he the Red Cyclone. Oh God! Well, there's four bad impressions. <laughs> I mean, mine was okay. <laughs> Yours was good. I wasn't even trying. <laughs> oh Jesus. Okay. Anyway, is, uh, do you have any final thoughts? Because like I, I got nothing, man. I think you know we talked about a lot of stuff. Um, I think Capcom sucks. 
Yeah, Capcom's pretty terrible. Crapcom <laughs> exists for a reason. Crapcom, yeah. They, I think they need to get on the ball with Street Fighter. Uh, fix the shit uh, that's wrong with it. Uh, I'm going to have a more in-depth review of the arcade edition once I actually sit down to play it. Uh, as for Dragon you Ball... Put that up on Joe Todd. Yeah, I will, definitely. And okay. uh, I'll be putting the... Uh, I'll be putting the podcast there every week, too. Like, I'm going to write written articles. Oh, sweet. Okay, written cool. articles, like, to summarize the podcast, and then I'll have the both parts of the podcast linked, and I'll be using uh, Sek's um, promo. I said Sek, yeah. it's a person, not not the intercourse, you fucking perverts. Um, yeah, so the promos he makes, I'll be using those for the articles, and I'll just, like, I'll write, like, brief summaries of some of the things we talked about, have it linked. So, yeah, there's a new plug for you guys. Check out jotaku.net for all your gaming and anime and manga article news and whatnot. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Cypher's well, a writer the there, notch. and I'm new. <laughs> yeah. So go go ahead. What were you going to say? Uh, I was going to say, um, have you poked uh, Najiru about that yet? I'm already signed up. I signed up like oh, four perfect. days ago. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, uh, Sec shared... Uh, his uh, tweet from Twitter, and I saw it. So I'm like, hey, uh, have you opened up the gaming yet? He goes, yeah. He goes, I want to keep the site anime focused, though. But he goes, okay. we could certain, but he goes, we could uh, we could do some gaming stuff, too. I'm like, all right, cool. So let me be your resident gamer. <laughs> yeah, like, I think that the thing would be, like, if we talked about a lot of uh, anime-esque games or things that people have, like, I don't want to say cross-cultural appeal, but, like, cross demographic appeal for otakus like i think monster hunter world although it's not te terribly anime-esque is something that a lot of otaku would like oh believe me when it? when we talk about or i should say when i talk about games i'm going to talk about you know all kinds of video games and of course with this podcast mm -hmm. we talk more about the mainstream than the anime-esque stuff but yeah. you know we do delve into that occasionally so uh man i i want to give a quick shout out to uh i hate sword art online I really do. But this isn't going to be Cypher bitching about something and tearing at a new asshole. Because I do that enough as is. Oh. Um, SAO <laughs> Last Bullet, Bullet actually looks pretty good. Like the upcoming PS4 game. Yeah, Doesn't I want to play it. Bad. I want to fucking play it so bad. Oh, uh, me too. I'm, I'm probably going to get it when it comes out. Um, One thing I want to say, I want to give a shout out myself, but I wanted to mention this at the start of the video. But uh, have you seen the video I I posted on Discord yesterday? Uh, no, I haven't. It was the uh, gaming historian. He did a, a documentary on the history of Tetris. Okay. Dude, that video is so fucking good. Like, you learn so much about the development of that game and the licensing hell that game went through. I mean, it's a very good video. It's an hour long. You have to just, like, sit down and watch it and just appreciate it. It's a Russian-developed game that was made at the height of the Cold War. You should have said that in Russian, goddammit. <laughs> oh my god. Back in my homeland, we only have two video games. Vladimir Putin Simulator and Tetris. <laughs> of course, those are just video games. Back, I mean, we also play KGB and American Capitalist Big Dog. But, you know. <laughs> also, Vodka Ball. <laughs> There's no ball involved. You just drink a lot of vodka. Uh, that would be your favorite sport. <laughs> oh, dude, I, I'm a whiskey guy, but vodka's pretty big. <laughs> oh, shit. Well, I think we pretty much nailed it this week. We're coming uh, coming right around the corner of an hour and a half, so... Uh, I guess we should uh, get into closing here. Mm. Uh, thanks for watching, folks. Again, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Twitch. Subscribe to the YouTube channel for more uh, videos and podcasts. Follow Black Sakura on Facebook. Follow Erin Fitzgerald, the amazing voice actress, on all her platforms. And check out jotaku.net, where Cypher and myself will be posting articles uh, here and there. And the podcast will also be there, too. And uh, some you know occasional game reviews that we may not talk about on this podcast. All the links will be down in the description box below. Uh, thanks for watching, folks. For Cypher, my name is The Rose, and we'll catch your ass down the road.